Here's a good article on the overconsumption of travel. <clears throat> EVs won't save us. We must cut travel too. So let's read this. This is from 2019, not too long ago. Just a few short years ago, but oh, how everything has changed in those two years. Electric cars won't shrink emissions enough. We must cut travel too. Everyone knows that changing the way we get around could reduce climate emissions. Cycle and walk rather than drive. Take the train, not the plane. And if you must use a car, make it an electric one. Now a European body is pushing a more controversial, oh, the controversy, solution for decarbonizing transport. Traveling less. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <clears throat> and uh, a, year, a, a year from the, the, the publication date of this article, a year from this article, a pan pandemic would force the entire planet to stop traveling or travel a whole lot less. Um, this must have been a master plan, of course. Must have been a master plan. <laughs> uh, I'm not, uh, you know, and I'm joking because it's just too complicated to get into, but I'm joking. Traveling less. <laughs> the EU's position since 2011 has been that curbing mobility is not an option. So they were like, since 2011, they were like, we can't, we can't do it. We can't stop people from traveling. We need, need to travel. On Wednesday, the European Academy's Science Advisory Council, which represents the EU's National Science Academies, published a major, major report on transport emissions. They published a report urging the EU to reverse its stance. It is high time we at least started the discussion. It's good. It's good. You started the discussion. In 2016, two years ago, <laughs> the transport sector overtook energy as the UK's biggest source of greenhouse ga gas emissions. Transport took over energy in the, in the UK in 2016. A milestone the rest of the EU could hit by or hit in the 2020s. Oh, so we, we don't really talk about this too much, do we? Um, I, don't, I don't hear this being a much, much discussed point that the transport sector took over energy in the UK. And I, and I, I assume it's because the energy sector has been decarbonizing in the UK. That's part of it. However, you know, if transport is going up, energy sector is going down. You know, it doesn't mean that it's staying static. It is increasingly clear that even a rapid switch to electric and other low-carbon vehicles won't be enough. It won't be enough to meet the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. Right? A rapid switch. How, you know, what is rapid? How long does it take to switch all the cars out? Um, which aims to limit global warming to 2C. Even if you did all the good things, there is still no way to meet the targets, particularly in freight, shipping, shipping, right? You can, <clears throat> you can get everybody to buy an electric car, but what are the, you know, what are the trucks running on? What are the ships running on? And what are the airplanes running on? Not running on, not running on electricity. In the EU, almost three quarters of transport emissions comes from cars, buses, and heavy goods vehicles. The block supports electric cars, which are getting cheaper, but still accounted for just 1.5% of the EU's new car sales. In 2017, I, I, I assume that's larger now. <clears throat> Running out of time. Transport can't be decarbonized in time to meet the 1.5C warming target outlined by the UN Climate Science Panel last year. Well, ain't nothing coming in time to meet the 1.5C target. We're, we're, we're there and we're about to be there. So we're not, there's no like we're going to stand or 1.5, no. Or we're not going to hit 1.5, no. Uh, says Kevin Anderson of the Tyndall, Tyndall Center for Climate Change Research. In Manchester, UK, there, there is a very clear message. 
If we are serious about Paris, we have to reduce the demand for transport too. But how? Anderson says public transport and other forms of shared transport, such as ride-sharing apps, are helping. They're, that, that's funny because that actually is a, <clears throat> that's a fallacy. Because ride-sharing apps like Lyft and Uber, actually, uh, they fall under the umbrella of Jevons Paradox. Which is, you think that having these cars out on the road would take cars off the road. No, it actually puts more cars on the road. That's been, that's been uh, shown to be like a real thing. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't reduce the, the amount of cars on, on the road. Or traffic. Could it help reduce the number of people who actually own cars? Maybe, but then if, you know, more people are buying cars and driving cars and driving Lyft and Uber, you, you know, they, you just gave your car to somebody else and you're going to call them and go, can you come pick me up <laughs> in the car that you bought to drive me around? <clears throat> um, Anderson believes electric bicycles could be a game changer to get people out of cars for short journeys. Yeah. <clears throat> and that, you know, that's way better, like an electric bike or a scooter. How about just ride a, a goddamn bike? <laughs> but I understand, you know, it takes a certain amount of physical um, strength to, to get around on a bike like everywhere. But simply putting up taxes on transport is unlikely to help, says Gillette. Instead, he believes we need, to in, we need innovative ideas that don't hamper trade. And damage economic growth. Well, you wouldn't want to do that now, would you? The carbon footprint of electric cars could be reduced, he su suggests, by building more battery factories in Europe. Oh, yeah, that's going to do it. Rather than importing batteries from Asian countries with fossil fuel-heavy power supplies, personal carbon allowances where everyone has a fixed quota. Oh, that's interesting. For how much they can emit. Could be an idea worth considering. Wow. My... I wonder though, <laughs> so I actually, I like that idea, personal carbon allowance, but, but are we going to put those allowances on the wealthy and the powerful? They should, they should be the first ones with a personal carbon allowance because they're the ones that use up all the carbon. So the first people um, should be like a backwards vaccine, right? The first people that the carbon allowances should hit would be the, wealth, the rich, powerful, wealthy. And then go on down the, the economic ladder, right? Until you get down to the, you know, once those people have been reined in, take it all the way down. Anyways, capping personal travel uh, would be the fairest way to address the problem because it is the wealthiest who travel the most and therefore pollute the most. We already have demand management. It's called the cost of public transport, the price of petrol, a small co cohort travel a small cohort travel as much as they want because they can afford to, says Anderson. Oh, so, and that almost sounds, well, we have like a carbon cap. Um, that would be, you know, something of a carbon cap. How about a, how about a maximum wage? How about a maximum wage? What about an ownership cap? How much can you actually own? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be awesome if we could cap how much people could actually a mass in wealth. Like, look, you don't need, <laughs> if you got $2 million, you're, you got, you got enough money to live for the rest of your life very comfortably. Jesus Christ. You know, you don't need anything more than that. And maybe you shouldn't, ha maybe you shouldn't be allowed to have anything more than that. I like that idea. I like that idea a lot. Even more than taxing the wealthy. And I like the idea of taxing the wealthy totally. But like, uh, like a wealth cap, like you just you just cannot own or a, a, aggregate or amass more than a certain amount of money, like you just can't do it. Not possible. I know that's totally totally weird and totally backward and totally radical, and and if you said that to most people in the world, they'd go, "Huh? What? I don't understand." I don't get it. 
Uh, say that again. Say it a little louder. I, I, can't, I didn't hear anything you said. Ah. <laughs> yes, I am a party pooper. <laughs> Raza. Black crow in a meat cap. Oh, I love, I love me a bit of a meat cap. <laughs> when I go out, when I go out on the town, I like to wear wear my meat cap. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes, a meat cap. I, I like it. And a nightcap. Yes. Yeah. No. I mean, no doubt. Keith Hayes says, make the rich pay us if they want to fly. <laughs> Indeed. Carbon dividends as a UBI. I get it. I get it. Yep. Basil Peterson. Yes. I like that idea. Close 800 military bases around the world and we would make a big difference. Indeed. Yep. Abolish the military. <laughs> I say somewhere, somewhere in the uh, in the last year, when there was the whole like defund the police movement on, which you know, which I get and I and I support, or you know, reforming, defunding, whatever, uh, d doing you know, doing major things around. Uh, police b brutality, but I I heard somebody say defund the military, and I was like, uh, yeah, that more more than ever, more than anything else on this planet, <laughs> defunding the military could probably do the most. Uh, Keith Hayes, 2% annual tax on household net worth between 50 million and 1 billion. Did you know, I mean, sure, sure. Did you know that the, 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 the income tax, the wealth tax, as it w might be called today, back in the 50s was like I, between 50 and, you know, 90%. It was incredibly high. So 2%, you know, you would think like, oh, that's, it's funny that the billionaires, the oligarchs, the, the vampire squid, the oligarchs of the world are like, oh my God, we've got to do, you know, they're just, they're responding to this 2% wealth tax as, as and, and by the way, Keith Hayes, Bernie Sanders' wealth tax plan was higher than Elizabeth Warren's, by the way, just so you know, look it up, it's on Google, but uh, the wealth tax that they used to have was like, it was like 50%, 60%, 70% at one time. There's no reason why that can't be done again. And there's no reason why there couldn't be just a hard, a hard income cap, right? A maximum wage. You cannot earn more than this. You, can't, you cannot earn more than this in a year. You cannot own more than this, period, in your bank accounts. Everything after that. You're going to have to give it away. You're going to have to whatever. Something, something, something. Andy the Gardener, there should be a cap on how many gold bars one can own. That's funny. That's funny. G. Demers, Holland already has a wealth tax. Well, I mean, lots of, lots of countries have a, It's not a new idea. It's an old idea. But yeah, back in the day, what? Um, yes, Jazz Farm, the highest marginal tax rate was at one time 90%. Exactly. Judy Truitt before Reagan, it was over 70. Like 2% is like goofy. Like, okay, it's something, right? It's a lot of money on some level. But like the fact that they're like arguing over like 1, 2%, should it be 4%? Like, it's like ridiculous. 
No, motherfuckers, 50%. <laughs> no, you, no. <laughs> like, what are we talking about? What are we talking about? 2%. 1%. Oh, 1% wealth tax. Whoa, that's really radical. Oh, no, it's not. That's like 1% or 2% wealth tax is no is a is a is a is like a nonsensical argument on, on some levels. It's like, "Whoa, whoa, what are you saying?" <laughs> you know, like, "No. 20%, 30%, 40%, 50%. Like, come on. G Demer is 100% marginal rate after certain ceiling. Is that in is that now?" The wealth tax in Holland. I mean, you know, not to discount what you're saying, Keith Hayes, I'm just saying like the, it's just kind of funny that that was like the, like a big policy platform kind of thing <laughs> during the last presidential rate uh, race. You know, the whole time it was like, you guys are arguing between a 1% and a 4% wealth tax. Like, and, and, on top of that, the reaction from the, the, the powers that be was like, how dare you, you know, take my firstborn child, <laughs> right? Oh, this 2% wealth tax, we will never let it come to pass. You know, like, what the fuck? What the fuck? No, 50%. 50%. Yes, 2%, that's class warfare, right? Exa exactly. Class warfare. That's exactly how they put it. That's it, this violence. <laughs> you, you are threatening, you are harassing us and threatening us with your 2% wealth tax. That is violence. <laughs> so ridiculous. Tucker Carlson. Oh, hey, you're boo. No. I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, some people have suggested that he might run for president. Yeah, not, no. No, thank you. Oh, 100% of marginal rate of a certain ceiling was in the USA. Oh, okay. 2% is better than nothing, but it's like, they won't even give you the 2%. They won't even say okay to the 2%. Like, but the thing is, the, the thing is, it's the, it's the argument key days. It's like, um, you know, it's the negotiation, which is kind of ridiculous. Like they're like, how about 2%? No, never. <laughs> right. Like, okay. How about 1%? Like, why don't you start at fucking 70%? And then, and then negotiate down, right? No, 70%. That's where we're going at, right? Be, you know, Bezos and Musk and all you guys. 70, we're going at 70%. We're, we're, we're coming at you hard, right? And then maybe negotiate down from there, you know? Like 2% is so funny. It's so funny. I don't, I, you know, I don't even get the, I don't even get the argument. I, it's just well below 2%. That's right, Irk one. <laughs> That's right. We must stay well below 2%. Or well, that will be the end of us. How will we survive? Yes, Duncan McCown, there's been a lot of wealth redistribution. Re redistribution can say that since the 1970s and upwards the class war has been going on for a while and the one percent launched it and they are so far winning they are winning because they've got everybody walking around the streets going oh my god if we were if we give everybody medicare for all it'll put a lot of people out of work <laughs> oh my god if we uh raise the minimum wage to 15 dollars an hour uh you know a lot of businesses would have to close like they've got people repeating just absolute nonsense. Joe Biden is a is a he's like a super radical progressive communist. <laughs> like okay. What? What? What planet are you living on? Anyways. We got off on on a political tangent there. But we'll go back to it. Uh, 
Um, this is from Ben C. Remember, carbon dioxide was below 400 parts per million for the last 15 million years. CO2 levels are now 418 ppm and rising. Some scientists, some scientists say we'll probably hit 550 ppm, which may well mean, <laughs> or we'll we'll just we'll just make that which will mean <laughs> will absolutely positively no questions asked will mean unsurvivable levels of warming, not may well. Um, but you know. We can still take emergency action. And emergency action is not retooling the airline industry. That's not emergency action. Hold on one second. Do you need some help? Yeah, emergency action is not retooling the airline industry. It's not um, replacing all the cars on the road with electric cars. It's not emergency action. Sorry. Oh, here's a frightening, 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 frightening thought or study or revelation. This is also from Climate Watcher. Study predicts. The oceans will start emitting ozone depleting CFCs. Did you did you know that the CFCs um, that we you know successfully took out of a bunch of products? Well, a bu while we were using the CFCs, the oceans absorb them. <laughs> did you know that? Just like CO two. Uh, just like CO two. Hold on one second. Yeah, just like CO2, and let's look at this very quickly. Um, this is from yesterday. Study predicts the oceans will start emitting ozone-depleting CFCs. Uh, the world's oceans are a vast repository for gases, including ozone-depleting chlor uh, chlorofluorocarbons, or CFCs. They absorb these gases from the atmosphere and draw them down to the deep where they can meet, remain sequestered for centuries and more. <clears throat> uh, marine CFCs have long been used as tracers to study ocean currents, but their impact on atmospheric concentrations was assumed to be negligible. Oh. Now MIT researchers have found that the oceanic fluxes of at least one type of CFC known as CFC-11, do in fact affect atmospheric concentrations in a study appearing today in the proceedings in the national, of the National Academy of Sciences. The team reports that the global ocean will reverse its longtime role as a sink for the potent ozone-depleting chemical. The researchers project that by the year 2075, if <clears throat> anybody's around to celebrate that year, the oceans will emit more CFC-11 back into the atmosphere than they absorb. <clears throat> Excuse me. Emitting detectable amounts of the chemical by 2130. Okay. Uh, I mean, these are kind of longer timelines, but still, you know, it's a kind of a bit of a piling on, if you will, of feedback loops. Uh, further... Further, with increasing climate change, this shift will occur 10 years earlier <laughs> and earlier or, and earlier and then earlier, right? So they're projecting that by 2075. Well, when are they protecting, projecting that the ocean becomes um, an emitter and not a sink? I don't know. Um, the emissions of CFC-11 from the ocean will effectively extend the chemical's average residence time, causing it to li linger five years longer in the atmosphere than it otherwise would. This may impact future estimations of CFC-11 emissions. 
anyways. Uh, an ocean oversaturated. A CFC 11 is a fluoro, cor, uh, chlorofluorocarbon that was commonly used to make refrigerants and insulating foams when emitted to the atmosphere. The chemical sets off a chain reaction that ultimately destroys ozone, the atmospheric layer that protects the Earth from harmful ultraviolet radiation. Um, so somebody has that to look forward to. Since 2010, the production and use of the chemical has been phased out worldwide only since 2010 wasn't it earlier than that am i wrong am i wrong <laughs> i thought i thought we were phasing that out a lot earlier than 2010 <clears throat> uh global treaty because that was not that long ago anyways under the montreal protocol a global treaty that aims to restore and protect the ozone layer Since its phase-out, levels of CFC-11 in, in the atmosphere have been steadily declining, and scientists estimate that the ocean has absorbed about 5 to 10% of all manufactured CFC-11 emissions. As con concentrations of the chemical continue to fall in the atmosphere, however, it's predicted that CFC-11 will oversaturate in the ocean, pushing it to become a source rather than a sink. Wow. Lovely. <clears throat> Good times. Good, good times. Robert Araujo says China and in, in India, <clears throat> excuse me, have started using CFCs and refrigerants seeing how it is the most inexpensive uh, inexpensive yeah yeah they've actually detected a ma you know uh an increase in the amount of cfcs in the atmosphere they think because of uh countries um producing it illegally or outside outside of the montreal protocol <clears throat> 